turn with me to the uh, 13th chapter of Luke as we're uh, praying to look at the Lord's Word here. The, uh, I'm going to give a brief update on Daniel Losey. Most of you know is a is a 11-year-old son of one of our missionaries and that they have been in Denver for the last couple of years because of health problems for Daniel, had hoped to wait for a heart transplant until he was 18, but his condition worsened and they had to uh, put him on the list early. Well, this week we received word, a heart became available, the heart transplant has occurred, and Daniel is doing uh, well. Um, So we're very, very happy to report that. Now, the next thing that has to happen is they have to take his immune system down to nothing so that it learns to accept the new heart. All kinds of danger for the next six months or so uh, from infection, from just about everything you want to name, including the possible rejection of that heart. But what what a great step forward from where we were last week. So for those of you who've been praying for Daniel, uh, thank you and please continue to remember him in prayer. So with that, let me read from the 13th of Luke, if you would stand with me, starting in verse 22. He went on his way through villages, through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, well, those who are saved be few, And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, for I tell you, for many I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We ask that you will open it up to our hearts and lives today, make it real, make it clear, crystal clear, perhaps as it's never been before, and cause us to see reality as you see reality. Then cause us to obey. As we come this morning, we commit Daniel to you. We thank you for the grace that's been exhibited in his life in the last couple of weeks, that of Amy and Wayne and their daughters. We pray now that you will continue to heal him. We ask that you will be with the family that is bereaved in order to provide this heart as they have asked us to do. Whatever, however they need to be comforted, would you comfort them and give them peace. We commit to you, Renee and Rachel, who are sitting here in front this morning and their life together as we've had the privilege to hear about it This week, their first year of marriage, what an adventure they've been on because they're committed to you. And now from Guatemala, they will be moving to Fort Lauderdale. And we pray that as they bring their ministry to the hard possibilities there, Spanish-speaking people, English-speaking people, but Lord, in different, different, difficult areas, we pray for your blessing on their lives as they Uh, do a new CD here before long. We're so thankful, Father, that you've brought them into our life, and we pray for their continued blessing, your continued blessing on their lives and their ministry. Commit to you, commit to you, Garrett and Kimberly, this morning, about, about to get married in a few months. And Lord, we're so happy for the wedding, but having spent time with them now, I'm so much happier because of their dedication and their commitment to you to see young people giving everything they have to you putting you first seeing that that's the way to true happiness lord it's just a thrill and i and i pray that you will bless them and the and their upcoming wedding and the lives that they are creating by your spirit and by the leading of your spirit and then lord across our congregation this morning i know there are Uh, heavy hearts, needs of all kinds, financial, physical, emotional, relationship. Lord, I just uh, thank you for the songs that we've sung and the healing that's available in Christ. And I pray that as we hear your word this morning, that will be part of the process. See how gracious you are and how gracious you have been, but to also see how much we need you. 
May that be true in the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being here. And if you haven't already, please turn to Luke 13. Hope you're bringing your Bible week after week. I hear a lot of pages, and I assume that's true, but um, you need those as we, as we look into God's Word. Let me start with a little story about a young lady who had um, set up house on her own and had been able to buy her first home, although she was still on her own and unmarried. But when she was rummaging through the attic in this new home, she found an old shotgun. And she didn't know what to do with it. She didn't do anything with guns in particular, so she called her father and said, Dad, I, you know, I found this thing. What do I do with it? And he said, well, I think the best thing probably is you should take it to the police and give it to them. And she said, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. I think I'll do that. And as she was about to hang up, he said, and, uh, and Katie, be sure to call before you go. Let them know you're coming with this shotgun because you don't want to surprise the police by walking into the station with a shotgun, right? Neither, beloved, do you want to be surprised on God's great judgment day. No way that you want that to happen. But that is going to happen to a lot of people, to billions of people, in fact. And that's what this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at all the way through verse 30, is about. It's about making sure you're not one of those who is surprised on Judgment Day. Verse 30 is kind of a key verse because it summarizes the section and says this, and behold, some who are last, meaning in this life, there are some who are last who will be first, and some who are first in this life who will be last. That's not the kind of surprise that you want to get. Most people think they're okay. They think they're on the narrow way that we talked about today, or perhaps they're not even worried about ways in particular. They just feel like they're okay. But the narrow way is called that for a reason because it's narrow. It's because there aren't very many people on that road. It's because most of them are over here on the broad way. And so Jesus talks about it in, the, in these terms. Few find it. People think they're okay. They forget that it's not what they think, but it's what Jesus thinks that counts. And so as Jesus is heading for Jerusalem, so he began that journey in chapter 9, verse 51. You may remember he's now on this kind of six-month sojourn to get from, from, uh, uh, from the northern part of Palestine down to Judah in the south. Somebody comes up to him, comes running up to him and says, Lord, will those who are saved be few? It's a great question, right? Wanting to know some information. Now, at the back of that information, we have to realize it's coming from the Jewish mindset of the time. It's coming from the mindset that said, hey, if you're a Jewish person to whom Jesus was primarily ministering here, you're part of God's chosen people. Therefore, you are okay. And so in asking this question, the guy who's asking it is basically making the assumption that the Jews are good to go. By the same token, they considered the Gentiles or anybody who was outside of the Jewish ethnic background to be on the outs. The presumption would be, by this questioner, that the Jews were the few who might be okay. So Jesus' answer comes as a complete shock. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. I mean, this is, this is an answer that's right between the eyes that Jesus is giving here. We have to understand that. He's saying, you want to talk about percentages? Let me tell you, the question isn't, is it few that will be saved? The question is, will you be saved? That's the question. You're asking the wrong question. You need to be one who is striving to enter by the narrow door. Are you one of those? Because if not, 
you're in for a surprise. And you don't want that surprise. You don't want to end up on the wrong end of that surprise. Will few be, be saved? That's a nice academic, easy, comfortable question, right? You can kind of debate that intellectually. Will you be saved? That's blunt. That's to the point. That's purposely intended to cause somebody to think, to get their attention. He, Jesus wants to get their attention now so that they don't experience this surprise later. That's what Jesus is doing here. Now, more shocking statements are going to follow, as we'll see in the next two or three weeks. They're all aimed at eliminating surprise. Where he's basically going is if we're thinking that we're one of the ones that is okay, we're considering ourselves first, and I would guess that's most of us here today, and probably most of the people we know. We're the first. And he's saying, no, you may be the last. Whatever you're counting on, whether it's your racial background, your church attendance, you're born in America, whatever it is you're counting on may not be right. Even proximity to Christ was no guarantee of salvation. And so our series, Don't Be Surprised, three parts to the series, simple, as it's laid out here in this passage. The first part, few will be saved. The second part, many will be lost. And the third part, it pays to be saved. Now, why will few be saved? That's what we want to look at today. Partly because we've, beloved, we've turned two great truths on their ear. We have absolutely turned them upside down. The two truths from this passage are this. It's easy to be lost, and it's hard to be saved. Now, we believe exactly the opposite, but I think I can show you this morning from the Word that we've got it backwards, and that that's what Jesus is trying to point out in this passage of Scripture. So let's look, first of all, at the first point. It's easy to be lost. What do you have to do to be lost? It's not even a term we use much anymore, right? Uh, people are thinking, lost? What's, what's that about? Well, it means a spiritual separation from God. What do you have to do to be lost? And the answer is, be born. That's it. That's all you have to do to be lost. And I think most of us have accomplished that, right? We've been born. Now, the problem is, most of us don't really see it that way because for the last 200 plus years, from the time of the age of enlightenment, age of reason, whatever you want to call it on, we have been told man is basically good. And we've translated that into, and good enough for most of us to be acceptable to God. So our belief is not that we are sort of born lost and there we are unless something happens inside of us, but that we're born good and we're okay with God unless we really screw it up. Typical. Uh, you, could, you could find illustrations of this all over the place. Let me just give you one typical statement. This comes from Melody Beatty's bestseller book called Codependent No More. She says this. She says, to honor the self is to be in love with your own life, in love, exploring our distinctively human potentialities. Thus, we can begin to see that to honor the self is to practice selfishness in the highest, noblest sense of the word. That, folks, is our cultural Bible. And if you, if you haven't been out in the cultural, uh, culture enough to realize this is what we are teaching, this is what your children are being taught, this is what many of us have kind of embraced as well without even knowing it. This is our cultural Bible. You don't need a savior. You need to love yourself. You don't need to be saved. You need to get a better self-image. Perhaps there are a few who are lost. Hitler, Stalin, you know, some of the madmen of our time. Perhaps they are lost. Murderers, terrorists, rapists, a few of those people, but even in those cases, it's pr 
probably explainable because of something that's happened in the past, you know, some traumatic experience that happened in the fourth grade. And so we excuse even that. Here's a quote from actor Will Smith. He said, even, <laughs> I love this, even Hitler didn't wake up going, let me do the most evil thing I can do today. I think it's the only statement I've ever seen in defense of Hitler. <laughs> coming from Will Smith. I don't know whether he doesn't know history or whether he's been so brainwashed by the cultural Bible that he really believes that. The basic philosophy behind that is if you don't think it's wrong, apparently it's not. Given that premise, it's not hard to be lost. It's well nigh impossible to be lost. So it's no wonder we don't talk about lostness. But is that what Jesus taught? Not even close. Look at the question again in verse 23. Lord, will those who are saved be few? Now the question itself implies that all people need to be saved, but that maybe there's only a few that will be. But the implication is everybody needs to be. And Jesus doesn't counter that assumption at all. But what he does is he goes on and he says, hey, let's, I'll tell you what, let's stop talking about the world. Let's talk about you. Are you saved? Because you need to be. The question and the answer both imply that lostness is the human condition. And it's a lostness we don't see. It's, it's a lostness we don't see because we measure by the wrong standard. I can, I can still see in my mind's eye, close my mind and see this, I can see Bob Beeman, a long, the long jumper, in the 1968 Olympics. I know it was a long time ago, but I can still see it. And here's Bob Beeman, and he's running down the track, and he jumps, and he, and, he, and, he, and he does this jump, and nobody knows what the distance is. It's not like today where you get instantaneous results. It took him a while to get the tape measure out and find out, right? But, but he's standing over at the side. He's waiting to see. Looks like it's a pretty good jump. And then they announce it, 29 feet, two and a half inches. You have to understand in the long jump, that's a, that's, a, that's a discipline that advances the world record by fractions of an inch at a time. And the existing world record at that time was set 27 feet, four inches. He, in one jump, exceeded the world record by almost two feet. I think it was, I think I can safely say it was the most astounding athletic accomplishment that I've ever seen. Two feet. For the next 25 plus years, long jumpers the world over kept breaking the old world record a little at a time. But by the measure of Bob Beeman's jump, they were hopelessly lost. They met every standard that had been set except the one that counted. Same with Jesus, beloved. The reason we don't understand our lostness is because we don't understand the standard. And you know the verses. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's kind of almost like long jump terminology, isn't it? How long has that been going on? Psalm 51, verse 5, in sin... Did my mother conceive me? It's been going on for a long time. And what's the result? Ephesians 2.1. Paul says, I'll tell you what you were before you came to faith in Christ. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You weren't just sick. You weren't just a little bit ill. You weren't just kind of bothered. You were dead. You were dead to God. That's how you were born. That's who you entered the world. That's your spiritual condition outside of faith in Christ. And the only solution in that same chapter in Ephesians 2.8 is that you need to be saved by grace through faith, not of works. That's what has to happen to take you from the realm of death to the realm of life. But we don't believe in lostness. Is man really as lost as the Bible says? H.G. Wells thought so, leaving aside the, the Bible for a moment. H.G. Wells was kind of an Enlightenment age optimist, late 19th, early 20th century. And 
He wrote Outline of History where he confidently predicted that all of the scientific advances, which in those days were many, in the realm of physics, in the realm of botany with some of the advances that have been made there, in the realm of even the psychology of Freud, he said, you know, in light of all the things that are happening in this wonderful world of, not Disney, but of science, this wonderful world, the world is getting, is getting better. We're going to improve. We're going to keep right on improving. We're going to get rid of sin. We're going to get rid of evil. We're going to get rid of all the poverty and racism, and things are going to be great. And then came World War I. And his confidence was deeply shaken. But, you know, by the end, it began to be thought, okay, well, this is the war to end all wars. So this is the purging process we had to, we had to go through to get from A to B. And his confidence began to come back a little bit, and then came World War II. With all of its unspeakable atrocities. And H.G. Wells wrote another book called A Mind at the End of Its Tether in which he said this, he said, homo sapiens, meaning men, but he was really playing on the meaning of the, of the term homo sapiens, which means the rational. The age of reason is what he's picking on here. The rational, he said, is spent. Homo sapiens is spent. This is the end. Philosopher C.E.M. Joad came to the similar conclusion. He said, the view of human goodness, which I adopted unthinkingly as a young man, I have come fundamentally to disbelieve. Nobel Prize winning author William Golding, some of you remember him, the Lord of the Flies fame. He said this after World War II, he said, I, believe in the perfect I believed in the perfectibility of social man, but after the war I was unable to. I had discovered what one man can do to another. Anyone who moved through those years without the understanding that man produces evil as a bee produces honey must have been blind or wrong in the head. You don't have to be a theologian to, be, to understand the evil that's in men. And let me tell you, nothing that's happened since that time has, would have changed our minds, would it? The atrocities in Vietnam, the purges of Pol Pot in Cambodia, the ethnic cleansing in Bosnia. Around our world, we've seen this over and over again. Rwanda, the ISIS thing that we're going through now. The truth is, beloved, genocide involving well-intentioned people is a function of who we are as people. We're, we're like the king in 1 first, in first Kings 16.31. You know what it says about Ahab, that evil king, it says that Ahab, to Ahab it was a light thing to walk in sin. That's how we look at it. We can rationalize anything. And if you look at your own life, you'll know that that's true, just as true of you as it is for the most evil person going. You rationalize whatever it is you want to do or believe or have available. We are experts. John Calvin said it this way. He said, the, he said our human hearts, our hearts are are idol-making factories. He was right. So if that's mankind in general, what about individuals? Chuck Colson, who was special advisor to President Nixon, got involved and caught up in the Watergate scandal, as many of you remember. When that was kind of coming to its peak, he went to a friend in August of 1973, and here's what he says. He says, I was seeking spiritual answers. It was a guy that he knew was a professing Christian. He said, I was seeking spiritual answers, but not for any escape from my sin. Despite the bombardment of Watergate charges, I saw nothing particularly wrong with myself. I knew that what I had done was no different than what everyone else had done. Right and wrong were not determined by absolute standards but were relative to people and situations. People in politics played dirty. It was part of the game. You see the problem, right? Wrong standard. He goes on. He says, but that night when I left my friend and sat alone in my car, my own sin, not just Watergate, but the evil deep within was thrust before me by the conviction of the Holy Spirit forcefully and painfully. 
For the first time in my life, I felt unclean. And I could, I could not turn away. I was as helpless as the thief nailed to that cross. And when I, what I saw within me was so ugly, I could do nothing but cry out to God for help. I got the right solution. But beloved, this is who we are. This is who we are without Christ. We don't even believe in lost anymore, but God does. See, it's not us who gets to make the standard. It's not us who gets to make the determination. It's not us who will be sitting in judgment. It is he. And God's truth is you are born lost. And until you see your heart as God sees it, until you see the selfishness, until you see the hatred, which he calls murder, until you see the lust, which he calls adultery, until you see who you are deep within, until you see that you can't be saved, why would you? We have to decide who's right. Society that says love yourself. And practice selfishness in the highest sense of that word, as if there was such a thing. You're going to believe that, or are you going to believe Jesus, who says, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself? That's the choice. It's easy to be lost. Second major truth that we don't understand it's hard to be saved. It's hard to be saved. Now, I know some of you are sitting there saying, how can you possibly say that? Please bear with me for a few minutes, okay? It's hard to be saved. The reason we find it hard to believe that is because for the last, again, 200 years, the typical presentation has been just walk the aisle, just raise your hand, just say the prayer, just turn in the card, and you're good to go. And you can do whatever you want after that. Getting saved is easy. We've all heard that. I grew up on that. I'm guessing many of you did as well. Getting saved it isn't hard. It's easy. But let me be very clear about this. When saying the prayer or walking the aisle, raising the hand or turning in the card or whatever else it is, when it reflects a truly repentant heart, it can be a sign of salvation. And some of you can point back to a time when that's exactly what your experience was. And the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that that's when you truly came to Christ. So I'm not fighting that particular issue, but I'm saying that it isn't the act tearing the corner off the cart or whatever else that makes us saved. It's the fact that our heart was repentant and had, was now turning away from self and toward God. You have to ask yourself, where in the Bible do you see Jesus saying to somebody, just say, hey, pray this prayer and you'll be saved. Pray this prayer and you'll be okay. Just come, come and, 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 and walk the aisle and you're going to be okay. You don't. Jesus didn't make it easy. If you haven't picked that up in Luke, Jesus made it hard. Because Jesus knew the reality. He demands complete and total allegiance reflected in a changed life. To Jesus, a saved person is one who, according to Matthew 7, 24, this is just one of many passages we could cite, a, a saved person is one who, quote, hears these words of mine and does them. In other words, they've counted the cost and they've said, I, I'm in. I want to submit myself to the Lordship of Christ. You say, well, but, 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 but listen, I, 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 listen, I thought it was just you just had to believe in him. I, I know I've heard that. In fact, isn't it John 5, 24? Jesus says, just believe in the in the Father and the one who sent him. Isn't it John 3, 16? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Isn't it? Isn't it Acts 16, 31? Just, Paul tells the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Isn't that true? Yes. Yes, it is true. But let me tell you what it means. First thing you need to know is that the word believe in Jesus in every single one of those passages is actually the word believe into 
Jesus. It's a, it's a different Greek word. It just doesn't translate well in English, so it's always translated believe in Jesus, but it's actually, the actual word is believe into. It's a commitment of your life to his. It's a, it's a signing on. It's a grabbing hold. Do you see? It's, not, it's, it's saying, I now identify with Christ instead of with me. That's what the phrase means. And then we have to go and say, well, how did Jesus How did Jesus define believe in me? And we've been through it in Luke 9, verse 23. Here's how Jesus defined it. He said, if anyone would follow me, let him, what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Yes, it's believe, but it's a believe that is a commitment of the life. Salvation, beloved, is dying to self and living to Christ. It's giving up my script for my life in exchange for his script. We forget to tell people about the giving up part. Salvation, think of it this way. Salvation is a momentary decision because it is. Thief on the cross was saved in a moment. I could, people all over the Bible are saved in a moment, but it's a momentary decision to make a lifetime commitment. That's what saving faith is. That's not even close to easy. That's hard. Look at what Jesus says in verse 24, Luke 13. He says, strive. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Strive. Agonizomai. It's a word that was used by the medics in Jesus' time that meant severe emotional trauma. That word is sometimes translated death agony or the agony of death. Jesus is saying you've got to go through the agony of death to enter the narrow door. That's what he's saying. That's what the word means. You have to agonize for this. You have to strive for this. Now, let me be really, really clear. Because the next thing people are going to say, oh, it's okay, so I got to strive for good works. No, no, it's not that. This is not strive to do good works. It's strive to leave good works behind. It's not strive to do good works. It's strive to leave good works behind because the natural inclination is I I gotta bring my good works. I'm gonna bring my good works and and I know I'm gonna be okay. And no, that's not what this is. This is a mindset. It's a mindset to leave good works behind because look what the rest of it says, to enter the narrow door, narrow, stenos, constricted. Think MRI tube. I'm thankful I've never been in one. Some of you have. When you go into the MRI tube, what do you take with you? Nothing. What do you do to get there? Nothing. You lay down on the table and they shove you in. But let me tell you, it takes a commitment to go there. Some of you can't make that commitment. Because why? Because everything is gone and you are surrounded by nothing. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Strive to enter the narrow door. You have to be committed to do that, to strive to enter. Is it few that be saved? Jesus is saying, let's forget about it. Let's let's not talk about the few. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about you. Do you want to be saved? Then you must strive to enter the narrow door, and it's constricted there. It's narrow there. You can't take anything with you through that door. You can't take your goodness with you. You can't take your idols with you. You can't take anything with you through that door. It's a hard door to enter because people don't want to leave those things behind. Think about what this means, beloved. What this means is that if Jesus were to stand right in front of you this morning and say to you, it's either me or your money, 
and you would take the money, then you're not saved. If Jesus were to stand in front of you this morning and say to you, it's either me or your relationship, and you would take that person, then you're not saved. You just think you are, and you've set yourself up for a huge surprise. If Jesus were to say to you, it's me or your career, it's me or sports, it's me or your family, it's me or all those plans you have for your life, it's me or your ambition, and you would say, oh, I can't give that up. You're probably not saved. Now listen, many of those things will be given back to you by Jesus on the other side, but you can't go through with them, beloved. You cannot get through the broad through the narrow door with any of those things. You're still on the broad way. Listen to what James Kennedy said, pastor of the Coral Ridge Church. I think I read this not too long ago, but it's applicable again. He says, the vast majority, listen to this. The vast majority of people who are members of churches in America today are not Christians. I say that without the slightest fear of contradiction. I base it on empirical evidence of 24 years of examining thousands of people. They've been told, just believe. But Jesus defines it differently than the world defines it. It's hard to be saved. There's two reasons it's hard to be saved. First of all, it's hard to find the door. And secondly, once you find it, it's hard to go through. It's hard to find the door because in our seeker-sensitive church culture, we've decided that we like numbers better than we like the truth of the gospel. It's not popular to talk about the narrow door. And so we don't. We give people feel-good messages about how to succeed in business, how to succeed in your marriage, how to succeed in relationships, how to succeed in life. We tell people how to have self-fulfillment. At the same time, Jesus is saying, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Do you see the polarization there? Saving faith is not about exalting me, it's about slaying me. I don't know any other way to say it. It's about killing me so that he can live in me. Now listen, carefully. What you get back when you do that is way worth it. It's worth way more than whatever it is that you have to give up to make that initial decision. But you do have to make that initial decision. We don't like to talk about it. The cross comes before the crown. Discipleship is costly. And we suggest it's just easy. We don't like to talk about that. That's why we don't talk about sin in our churches. We don't talk about the cross. We don't talk about the blood of Christ. We don't talk about the atonement. We don't talk about death to self because it offends people. Jesus told us it would. He said the Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 that preaching of the cross is for sure going to offend people. Just just get used to it. It's foolishness to them, but to God, it's the means of salvation. So people can't even find the door because we don't tell them. And if by some hook or crook they get to the door then they can't get through because we tell them that somehow they can have their idols in Jesus too. You can take Jesus by one hand, you can take your idol by the other hand and go through. Not according to Jesus. The truth is you have to enter the the MRI machine completely on your own. You can't take anything with you. There's no baggage. And and going through the narrow door is the same way. You can't take any baggage with you there. You, You don't get to negotiate. I'll take Jesus if he doesn't send me to Africa. I'll take Jesus as long as he doesn't attach my bank account. I'll take Jesus as long as he doesn't mess around with my sexuality. 
I'll take Jesus if I don't have to tell anybody. I'll take Jesus as long as it doesn't cost me the one thing in life that I want. It doesn't fly. It's a narrow door. You can't go through it by negotiation and you can't go through it with that kind of baggage. Let me give you one illustration. Christopher Yan, 20 years old, Chinese boy, lived in Cincinnati a few years ago when he came out of the closet, acknowledged his gay lifestyle. His parents, even though they were not Christians, were absolutely devastated. Threw him out of the house. He ended up on the streets of Louisville selling drugs to try and make his way. Though he was a very bright young man, he just kind of gave up on life at that point. His parents were absolutely driven apart by this. Divorce became imminent within a short period of time. And that so devastated his mother that she bought a one-way ticket from Cincinnati to Louisville on the train to go tell her son goodbye and then to take her life. On the train, to show you God's providence, somebody gave her a gospel pamphlet. And she started reading it. And she got interested. So when she got to Louisville, she sought out a church, found a Bible teaching church, and she began to talk to the pastor there. She stayed for six weeks, and during that period of time, as she began to study the Bible, she entered the narrow door. She went through. She went home. She told her husband. He became a Christian, came to faith in Christ as well, and they began to pray for their son, put the divorce proceedings aside, and then they told their son about their faith. And he said, being a good postmodern relativist, great, that's good for you, but not for me. It's not for me. Glad it works for you, not for me. So the family decided to move from Cincinnati to Louisville. They did, and they were there one day when the police came and took their son away. They caught him dealing his drugs. He went away for a six-year sentence in jail. And you know what his mother prayed? His mother prayed, Lord, don't let him out until he's come to faith in Christ. It's a mother who knows her priorities, right? Don't let him out until he comes to faith in Christ. That's tough love. Christopher got a hold of a Bible while he was in prison, he began to read it. Basically, just through reading the Bible, he began to realize if he was going to come to faith in Christ, if he was going to kind of follow his parents in that regard, it was going to cost him some things he would have to change if he came to Christ, if he really came to Christ. He knew that drug dealing would have to go, and he was willing to give those up, but he also felt that his sexuality was contrary to the Bible, and he wasn't willing to give that up. So he went to the prison chaplain. He explained the dilemma to him, looking for help. He said, what can I do? How can I get over this hurdle? And the chaplain said, what hurdle? You don't have a hurdle. He gave him a book that explained that, hey, homosexuality is fine with the Bible. So Christopher began to investigate. He began to read that book with one hand, with the Bible in the other hand. And the more he read, he saw that the book was in error, if the Bible was true. And then he makes this comment. He says, I had no reason to reject what that book was claiming. It would have been the easier route. Embrace my sexuality, as the world says, not to have to deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow Christ. I knew I was at a turning point. Either reject God and pursue gay relationships by allowing my feelings to dictate how I lived, or abandon gay relationship and live as a follower of Christ. And then he says these marvelous words, I chose Christ. You chosen Christ? Really? Chosen Christ? He went in to write a book called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God. Now let me ask you this, did giving up drugs and giving up a gay lifestyle, did that make Christopher a Christian? No. That's not the point. What made him a Christian was his submission to the Lordship of Christ and what made it possible for him to give up the 
drugs and to give up the gay lifestyle was the fact that he had made the commitment to Christ. Do you see the difference? Huge difference. Have you chosen Jesus, beloved, to the exclusion of all others? It's what saving faith does. You remember the rich young man <clears throat> who came to Jesus and said, you know, what do I have to do to be saved? I've kept the whole law, by the way. Jesus didn't even argue with him. He just said, I'll tell you what, just go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, why did he tell him that? He didn't tell, he didn't tell uh, Zacchaeus that when he wanted to become a Christian. In fact, there's nobody else in the Bible that Jesus ever told that. Why did he tell that to this man? Because he was putting his finger on the idol that was in that man's life, which was his money. And what he was saying is exactly what this passage is saying. You can't enter the narrow door with me in one hand and with your money in the other. You can't. It doesn't work that way. That young, one, young man says, the Bible says Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. But he went away sorrowful. Don't go away sorrowful. Jesus loves you too. He does. It's easy to be lost because we're born that way. It's hard to be saved because that can't happen until we realize we're lost and we're willing to come to God on his terms. Bringing nothing except our sin. You say that's impossible. You're right. That's why there's grace. Jesus tells us it's his grace that allows us to go. It's his grace that calls us. It's his grace that enables us. It's his grace that makes it possible for us to go through the narrow door. But listen, beloved, if you feel the tug of God on your heart today, if you feel his grace operating, don't put off the decision that you must say to open your heart to him to cast yourself on his mercy and to say as the man in 18 said, God, be merciful to me, sinner. Don't put it off. It's only right when he's given everything for us to ask us to give everything for him. It's easy to be, it's easy to be lost. It's hard to be saved. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I, I, my only prayer is that somehow your word will be so clear that, that the hearts that are here this morning that don't know you will, will open to you. That they will see that what's on the other side is so worth it. Yes, the narrow, war, the narrow road is narrow. But it opens up into a vast vista of things we could never imagine and we will never regret coming to you in faith. So please open our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.